Well, here we are. This is the Physics 2A Video Lecture 3. So let's get started. I'm in the big lecture hall again because I wanted to have some demonstrations. Got a little more whiteboard. I see there's glare. We'll just have to see how this works out. So we're in chapter 8 and let's remind ourselves what we're doing here. We're doing rotational dynamics, but first we did statics. So I'm going to go ahead and do one or two more static problems, and then we'll do the dynamics. So statics first, and then rotational dynamics. Okay. So what is a static problem? We have the equilibrium conditions. And the equilibrium conditions are that the sum of forces equals zero, and the sum of torques equals zero. Now the problem we had was with the ice cream sign, or whatever that sign was. So let's go ahead and investigate this thing. I'll have a nice sketch here. Let's uh, see. So there's the wall. There's a beam coming out. There is a sign hanging from the end of the beam. And in order that the beam not just twist and bend off, you can see it's a structural problem. You have to attach a cable here. And so there's our cable picture in the book wasn't quite accurate, but they did say we have the forces, you know, at the wall, and we have the cable at the end of the beam there. Okay, so there's the thing. It does say ice cream on it, so let's go ahead and write that as well. Ice cream. But yeah, what's the equilibrium condition on this? you would have the cable has a tension. So right now we're just attaching all the forces. There's a T. They put the angle up here. That's not where I would have put it, but there it is. So that's the tension. Then we have at the wall, I have to draw these fat. At the wall we have an RX and an Ry. Those are just forces. I named them R. We can think of a reaction force or something. Then we have at the center of the beam, Mg, and at the center of the sign, we have, I'll use capital Mg. So there's the entire set of forces. Okay. Now we have to set up our equilibrium conditions. And I'm going to set them up in X, in Y, and in torque. So the X forces are going to be R sub X pointing to the right. That's this arrow here, minus T. And then you have to see, where is this angle here, this angle there? down here again. So it's minus T sine of theta is equal to zero. Now in the Y direction we have quite a few forces. I should have left myself a little more room. Here we go. In the Y direction we have R sub Y pointing up minus MG pointing down minus capital MG pointing down plus T cos theta pointing up equals zero. That's the equilibrium condition in y direction. And finally, the torque. The torque we're going to measure right around the axis here. We call that the axis, where we measure the torque. And we're going to have to include some lengths here. So let's let the beam have a length 
L. And uh, let's just let the distance D be the distance from the wall to the center of the sign. Okay. And then we can use the information they gave us to figure that out afterwards. Okay, okay so what do we have for torques? We have no torques are caused by these two forces here because they're on the axis. So we have mg, lowercase mg, producing a torque with L over 2 is the length of the lever arm. And then we have minus capital mg producing a torque with this distance d that we still have to figure out. And then we have T sine theta, no, T cos theta, same as here, T cos theta, producing a torque at the length L. So that equals zero. So this is the whole goal of this problem. Can we set up these equations? Can we set these equations up? Before we even dream of plugging any number in, we've got to take a close look at these. How do we solve? How do we solve? I'm going to um, go on to the board above there in a moment. This board can't be lifted. It hasn't been repaired yet. Okay. So just to analyze these, this third equation is the one that has only one unknown tension. Okay. So solve, solve tau equation for t. Right. We see that we can do it because we have that written down there. It's the only unknown. Once you have that tension, you can get, now this is known, you can get r sub x. And once you have that tension, you can get r sub y then r sub x and r sub y. So there's an equilibrium problem. I'd like you to be able to do problems like this. I'll probably do one more on the review, but for now we're going to leave it at that and move on into the dynamics part, which is where we had left off on the last lecture. I had been talking about rotational dynamics and under rotational dynamics, we had Newton's law. I'll just write Newton law for rotation. And that had the form, so this will be one of the last things on your notes. That had the form torque equals I alpha. And it was directly related to F equals MA. So that's the next thing I'm going to put down. Okay. Here's what we'll do. I've got this much of the board available here under this line to get started. So again, we have torque. Moment of inertia times angular acceleration. This is the Newton's law, so once again, let's write this down. Tau equals I alpha with the moment of inertia being the sum of masses times their distance from the axis of rotation squared. Okay. And I brought some stuff along where we can actually learn a lot about this. What we're going to do is compare this equation, or actually, this equation was derived directly from Newton's law. I took Newton's law and multiplied it by r, both sides, okay? 
So I'm just going to say compare F net equals NA. That's the comparison that we're making, or that's where we use this to derive this thing right here. So right now at the moment, we are focused on this quantity, the moment of inertia. And I've given a little demonstration with a ruler, but that wasn't nearly enough. So this is the resistance. And by the way, if this is a problem coming up, I'll, I'll note that the units of this are just kilograms meters squared. Okay. This is the resistance to rotation. So what has a resistance to rotation? Well, maybe we should just start with a wheel. This wheel happens to be pretty hefty. You know, I have to give it a good twist to get it spinning, and then it stays rotating for quite a while. Okay. If you had this in your hand, you'd actually feel a bit of resistance because it's massive. This tire seems to have been filled with something solid. Okay. Pretty massive. What else has resistance to rotation? A ruler. A ruler, that's what I was trying to do with my little one, if you twist it like this, you're feeling a resistance in your wrist. If you grab it at the very end and twist it, you feel quite a bit more resistance. You guys have a yardstick or something at home? Don't bash anybody, but go ahead and try this, okay? Okay, so it's that resistance to rotation. And what we have here is, here is our formula. The sum of the masses times their distance squared. Now in this wheel, pretty much all of the mass is just concentrated around the hoop here. The spokes are very little mass. So all of the masses are the same radius distance away from the center. So the moment of inertia of this wheel is just mr squared. You know, I'm going to get a little list going. You'll find this chart in your book. But let's go ahead and open up some space here. out of this definition, the moment of inertia, so I'm going to write moments of inertia, and one is the hoop. This is the simplest one to get. I is simply equal to the mass times the radius squared. I'm literally just talking about a hoop of radius r. Now the other two that I want to describe, the uniform disk actually takes a bit of calculating to figure out, but you can imagine if the mass of this hoop were spread out thinner uniformly across the entire face of it, the wheel as a disk, there would be more mass towards the inside and those distances squared would be smaller. So there's considerably less moment of inertia if you spread out the mass uniformly across a disk, and what you have, in fact, is I equals one half and bar squared. The third one is the sphere. These are all radii of R. I equals two fifths and R squared. Okay, so they have different moments of inertia. And that has consequences. So I'm going to show you an interesting demonstration. First, these are kind of interesting. You really have to be here on this one. So these are two identical sticks. Okay, but what they've done, and they weigh the same, they have the same amount of wood and aluminum, but this one has the metal in the center, this one has it on the end. And so 
They have different rotational inertia. This one's very easy to twist. This one is much, much more difficult. Kind of thing you gotta try sometime. You can make demonstration objects like yourself like this. Very easy to twist this one, much more labored. Because the moment of inertia has more mass farther away. The mass farther away you square it, and therefore you get that higher value. Okay. So this has consequences in uh, an interesting inclined plane demo. Maybe I'll bring this whole box up here. Namely, suppose we have, and we do, a disc and a hoop. And these have been manufactured to weigh exactly the same. This one's metal, this one's wood. You put them on a scale, they're going to balance. Question is, which one has a greater moment of inertia? They're the same mass, then the disc would apparently have half the moment of inertia of the hoop. So what's the consequence of that is when they race. Okay. So let's run a race down here. You guys make your bets on who's going to win the race. Metal hoop for the wooden disc, same radius, same mass. On your marks, get set. The disc, much faster. Once more, for the rolling race, this has consequences. Okay. Much faster. So we have been, way back when we have all kinds of examples like this. So here is a hoop, and here's a disc, aluminum. I'll put the hoop on this side. Okay, disc wins again. This one is a little more subtle. So these are wooden discs, and they've had cores of uh, lead, I think, some kind of metal, maybe steel, plugged into them. And you can see this one has them towards the center, this one has them towards the outside. Which has the greater moment of inertia? Okay, the one on the outside, similar to um, hoop versus disc. And once again, we're going to see the clear winner of the rolling race, the one with the lower moment of inertia. Okay, so I've shown that. show you that couldn't just be done theoretically, right? You have to see that with the moments of inertia. Okay, so that's the dynamical quantity here. The resistance to torque plays the role of the mass in Newton's law. Okay. So now we're going to go here again. We have Newton's law, and I want to also obtain kinetic energy. Of rotation. Kinetic energy of rotation. I spin up a wheel, it has kinetic energy. I did some work on it, now it's rotating. All of its masses are moving. So let's look at this. Kinetic energy of rotation. What we're going to imagine is it's a half times the sum of all of the masses times their speed squared in a rotating object. So here's our rotating object rotating with angular speed omega. And it has all these little mass elements, m sub i. They're all zooming around. So one half sum of all the individual mass times speed squared, we have the sum of the mass, and then the V from rotational motion we know is R omega. 
So this you have to look back on your rotational motion formulas. Rotational kinematics, B equals R omega, so B equals, all right, omega R from rotational kinematics. And we get one half. Now, the omega is common to everything, so it doesn't carry a subscript. So I can write one half sum of mi ri squared omega squared. Yeah, we get something really interesting. Put this right here. Namely, the kin kinetic energy of rotation is equal to one half i omega squared. So we're going to set up some comparisons to Newton's law again. Okay. In fact, we can make a two column setup here with these comparisons. That might be a good thing to do um, because the analogy is complete. All the way down, starting with the rotational kinematics equation we had earlier. Okay, good, now we have everything in place. I'm going to erase just about the whole board now. You guys have the notes. And I'll set up a rolling race problem as we just saw. So let's see, let's go ahead and erase all this. Okay, good. I want to show this rolling race now that I did in front of you. I want to do it theoretically on the board. Okay. The rolling race. And so we're going to analyze the thing. Let's just call this downhill rolling race. And I'll put the picture here and I'll do the calculation underneath. So the picture is this. We have a ramp x and y, and we start something off at point A here, and then down here at point B, we want to know how fast is it going at point B. Okay. Now, is there any friction in this problem? There's no friction. So what we're looking at is conservation of energy. And that's why I wrote A and B. It's always a dead giveaway. Energy is conserved. Energy is conserved. So let's have a look. E sub A is equal to E sub B. And if we're releasing it from rest at the top, we just have potential energy, so I'm just going to write mg, and we're releasing it from a height h as often is the case. So we have mgh. Now there won't be any potential energy here at the bottom, but it's going to be moving kinetic energy. Now it's going to have the following: one half m. I better keep my m's consistent. 1 half m v squared, so that's kinetic energy translational, but it's also going to have 1 half m omega, 1 half i omega squared, and that's kinetic energy of rotation. So it has two kinds of kinetic energy, and therefore, it can't be going as fast as something that we're just sliding down without friction. The rolling motion sucks up some of the work, so to speak, 
And right, depending on the moment of inertia, these objects will be moving faster or slower. So let's do the analysis. And we know that V is equal to omega R for the rolling object. So now I can plug this in here. And I have M G H is equal to one half M V squared plus one half I. And then the omega is V over R quantity squared. equals, I'm going to write one half v squared, and then I will have m plus i divided by r squared. So you can see, this i over r squared is, based, is in a sense how much slower this other one is going to be going. Let's go ahead and solve for v squared and see what we get. v squared is equal to 2mgh is cross multiplied into 2 divided by m plus i over r squared. So that looks a little complicated. I'm going to divide top and bottom by m and you'll see what we get here. Final result, v is going to be a square root you guys can do this in your own time. I'm just going to get the answer there. So think square root of both sides, right? Um, I've got a 2 in there. Divide top and bottom by m, I get 2gh divided by 1 plus i divided by m r squared. Now, this is v sub v. This square root of 2gh we've seen so many times. Right? It shows up all over the place. Square root of 2gh. We're dividing it by something bigger than 1. 1 plus something. And therefore this speed is slower. Slower. And the greater that i is, the greater the denominator, the slower the thing is rolling. So that's a real... Like I said, this is something with consequences. Car manufacturers, wheel manufacturers, all kinds of um, manufacturers of rotating, pro um, rotating objects, race cars, all have to make use of this knowledge and reduce their moments of inertia when they want top speeds. Okay, so very, uh, very important in applications. Okay, so we got the rolling race. And let's see, we want one more dynamics topic, and then I'll start us on some homework. Yeah, so the dynamics example, that's going to be tau equal I alpha. So we're going to try to apply Newton's law to a typical situation. I'll give one of these on the homework. Actually, the one I'm about to do will be on the homework in similar form and then a slightly different one as well. Okay, so the example is if you have a spool, a disc with string wrapped around it, with an axle through here, so there's string wrapped around, maybe I should make the string blue, We've got a string here, and we've got a bucket. And you can imagine, we've got the bucket here. And it's going to fall under gravity and unwind this spool. So that's a great dynamics problem. What do we have here? We have a radius r, mass m. If it's a disk, then i would equal m r squared. If it's a uniform disk, 
let's go ahead and set up the basically the Newton's law problem here. And as we write everything down, we've got mg for the bucket, and we've got the tension in the string. Now, the same string here is pulling on this disc with a tension, and that's what's causing the torque to spin this thing up. So we have, for the disc, tau equals I alpha, and what we have for the torque is tension times R. What we have for the disc is M R squared, and we have alpha R equals tangential acceleration. So for the alpha, we have tangential acceleration divided by R. So this is one equation. That's Newton's law for the disk. Then we have the bucket. For the bucket, it's F equals, okay, let's write that properly. For the bucket, it's F equals MA. Okay. And therefore, we have minus T plus MG, lowercase mg here, is equal to MA. We'll put a box around both of these. These are our two equations. Notice I have two different masses. I have the mass of the disk and the mass of the bucket. And we can solve these two equations. Uh, by the way, what you're going to get here is a cancellation of R because this squared goes away and then that one goes away. So the first equation simplifies a lot. T is equal to, um, did I say MR squared here? Correction before this is immortalized. The disk was MR squared over two. The hoop was MR squared. Disk is MR squared over two. Okay, good, we caught that. Caught that. Yeah, so this simplifies quite a bit. You're going to have T is equal to MA divided by 2. And here, if it's a capital M, you're going to have T equals MG minus A when you solve for this one. So solving these two equations is going to be on the homework problem. You can get the tension and the acceleration. So I'm just going to write here solve for A and T. That's a complete application of one of these dynamics problems, or rotational dynamics. Yeah, so it makes it a little more complicated. No doubt about that. A little more to think about. A lot of good applications, though. Let's see what we have here in the... Um, next homework assignment, which I'll get you started on. Oh, I wrote down quite a few. Let's have a look here. I'm going to write all of them down and then we'll maybe take some out. Okay, yeah, once again though, we had an energy, an energy example and a Newton's Law rotational dynamics example. So those two uh, types of problems we want to be able to do. That's basically what we want from today's discussion. These two types of problems, the ramp problem and then the unrolling bucket problem. Okay, I'm going to erase this and the other four as well. So, homework problems. I'm not numbering these now. They're 
you know, do, what did I say, every Friday, I put several due dates, so there's four more due dates, they, they all weigh, they all count for quite a bit every, uh, um, every Friday. Check the syllabus, I put the due dates up, and along with your lecture notes, which is just as important as the homework problems, I just want to make sure you're writing stuff out and making progress. So what I have here is chapter eight, I'll write them down and then we will discuss them. Chapter eight, I have 39, 45, 58, and then 90 and 93, if we get that far. Let's see, those may be a bit ambitious. So let's have a quick look here. Moving right along, we had 39, a grinding wheel in the shape of a solid cylinder, which is a disc, okay, solid cylinder, rotates, tangential force. Okay, so this is one that just has some, some uh, numbers, but let's go ahead and set this up. So we've got a, so for 39, we have some grinding wheel, okay, so it's a wheel. We're going to have the torque equals I alpha. Now, what have they given us here? They have given us they have given us the radius. So R is given and a constant tangential force. force F is given as well. So these two quantities are going to give you the torque. Okay. Then they give you some information about how long it takes to spin up from which you can find the alpha. Well, what do you know? They actually give you the alpha. Okay. So they also give you the alpha Good, so you're going to calculate the torque using these two. Given the alpha, then you'll find the moment of inertia. Okay. So that's a good problem to go through to get these ideas settled. And they're doing some numbers, no big deal. Okay. And then. Part C asks for the result using the rotational kinematic equations. Okay, good, that one's no problem. What else do we have here? 45, 45. 45 is a merry-go-round that's being spun by pulling on a rope. So that one won't be bad at all either. So again, you're going to use this equation and then for both of these, 39 and 45, you got to remember your rotational kinematics. Okay. And what were the rotational? Let's go there. What were the rotational kinematics? We had theta equals theta zero, omega zero t plus a half alpha t squared omega equals omega zero alpha t omega zero squared plus two alpha theta minus theta. Remember you had those kinematic equations and yeah this alpha here is the one we're talking about right here. So in and omega r is equal to v tangential and alpha r is equal to a tangential. That whole set pretty much completes uh, the set of equations that you have to have. Okay, so 39, no problem. 58 is the bucket. Okay, so 58 I set up for you in your notes, so that'll be a good one to have a look at. Just go through it systematically. And then what about these other two, 90 and 93? Um,
Yeah, I'm going to call these kind of bonus problems. So if you can do these well, then go ahead and play around with these also. Okay. If you can do these three, these are the important ones. That's the difficulty I want you to be able to, to do for sure. These are a little more challenging, not that bad either. Okay. So concentrate, I'll just call these extra. Not extra credit, just extra fun. Okay, those are extra. Okay, that's a good start. So I'll leave this up here for now. Um, what we're going to do next time is the angular momentum. So let me put this here, you can read up on this. Next time, finish chapter eight. Angular momentum. Okay. Angular momentum, there's a conservation law there. Very, very interesting topic. Um, yeah, so go ahead and read up on that as well. And uh, this was video lecture three, and the fourth one we'll talk, we'll wrap up chapter eight and do the angular momentum. And I'm pretty sure it'll be in here as well because I need to show you some angular momentum demonstrations again, not just calculations. Okay, good.